Hey, deserving listeners, today I'm going to answer patron emails. This first email is from patron Nathan from France. He writes, since you're a family therapist, I was wondering if you sometimes used genograms. What is your opinion of genograms? End of email from Nathan from France. Yes, I absolutely do use genograms. If you don't know what genograms are out there, they are uh, clinical family trees in which uh, a clinician or anybody really uh, uh, graphically depicts your family tree in a way that helps uh, clinically to assess and also to just keep track of things. I use genograms for a number of reasons. The two main reasons are one, just to keep track of people's names as, as if even in individual therapy, if a client tells me about their spouse or their kids or their parents or their grandparents or their cousins, I need somewhere in my notes to keep track of those people. And instead of writing it out in sentence form, I can jot down notes next to the person on the family tree. Like if someone died, for example, I can mark, mark down the year they died, how they died. And then say weeks later or maybe even years later when they refer to that person, I can look at my notes and very quickly by looking at the genogram know uh, just some of the details about um, that person's life without having to re-ask my client for that information. You know, when you're in therapy, you just kind of want your therapist to remember the details that you tell them within reason. And uh, especially when I was practicing full time and I had, you know, 30, 40, 50 clients and many of them were on the, you know, sort of short term, say three or four months, there was a lot of details sort of uh, floating around in my brain and I needed notes to keep track of that stuff. Having said that, after a while, you know, most of my clients now, if not all of them, I've been seeing for at least a few years, uh, if not much longer than that. I don't need the notes anymore because it's all in long-term memory. And plus, I only have a handful of clients to begin with at this point because I'm a professor and a podcaster as well and a supervisor. So uh, the genogram helps with keeping track of information. The second use for a genogram is to help with conceptualizing what the problem is. When you have a client who is depressed or has a personality issue or an attachment issue or some kind of relational pattern in their life, it is sometimes very helpful to conceptualize that within the family system. How does that person's behavior, especially when you're treating a family, but even when you're treating an individual or a couple, it is important to assess the system because people don't live in isolation and we shouldn't assess people in isolation. We should assess them within their emotional system, which involves often their close family members, if not their friends, if not their coworkers, this kind of thing. And to understand someone, to understand their life, to understand their problem, to understand how to uh, move towards solutions, you must understand the emotional system in which someone is embedded. For example, someone comes in and says that they're anxious or they're depressed or they don't like the way their life is going. Well, for sure, I'm going to talk with that individual about how they feel about it, what they think. But another aspect to assessment and treatment is to say, is to ask questions around like, well, what's your family life like? Um, tell me about those people who are close to you. What are your relationships like? How do you feel about those relationships? How do those relationships affect you? These are, these are very important things to assess. And then if you're a systemic thinker like I am, then sometimes you want to assess, well, uh, how does anxiety and attachment, bidding and injury move through the family system that you're in? Um, how do you seek closeness with others? How do you react when other people hurt your feelings? How does anxiety about distance and closeness move through your family in a way that affects everyone, including you? Uh, these are very important things, and a genogram can help with that. All right, great question, Nathan from France. Let's move on to another email. Okay, this next email is from an anonymous patron. He writes, So before I was together with my girlfriend, she was drugged. Apparently she was at a bar and met some guy and she doesn't remember anything. She woke up on some random person's lawn after that. My question is, 
Would there be any trauma assuming she was sexually assaulted, but was drugged and didn't remember it? Is there some part of her mind that would have stored that event? End of email. So to address your question directly, yeah, it's possible that a part of your brain might, quote unquote, remember it and thus have a trauma response to that. But really, more importantly and more likely, imagine you're, you wake up on some random person's lawn and you start piecing things together and you're thinking, wait, what happened? What happened to my body? Was, you know, was I assaulted? Was I filmed? Was I violated? Am I pregnant? Do I have a, you know, an STI? Um, was I in danger of, of being killed? Uh, what day is it? Just that realization alone is traumatizing. To wake up and suddenly think, wait, I don't remember what happened to me. In all likelihood, something really bad did happen to me. Uh, that is, imagine the adrenaline rush you would have. Imagine the terror you would feel. Imagine the visualizations that would run through your mind in terms of what might have happened to you. So, yeah, that's a traumatic event for people. And you'll hear people talk about this, actually, when they have dissociative events, like this with dissociative identity. It's, it's and, and, you know, people with dissociative identity often become familiar and comfortable and and used to their dissociative episodes, uh, meaning when they switch alters and they don't remember having switched, you know, five hours or three days of time that have passed and they don't remember anything that happened. Uh, people eventually become mostly used to it, so it's not traumatizing. But before they get treatment, before they realize what's happening, it's very distressing to people to, to lose that time. And uh, that, that's very upsetting and, and traumatic in the same way that being raped might be traumatic. Also, like I said, the visualization of what happened to you can be traumatic as well. Uh, you just imagine like, well, I was probably raped. And then you are inevitably going to run through like what that might have looked like in your head. Um, that is a traumatic visualization, Right now, if you woke up from, uh, you know, you didn't know what happened and you woke up at the lawn, someone immediately runs up to you and says, uh, you've been fine this whole time. I've been watching. You had a seizure. Uh, no one hurt you. And uh, that's why you don't remember the past 12 hours. And let's say the victim uh, believes that and that is actually what happened. Um, there's a chance that the trauma would be less, right? Because the story in your mind of while you were passed out is one of at least generally more safety than a story of what is unknown and what is probably more likely is that, you know, she was drugged and raped. And so it's important to recognize that just because we don't remember something doesn't mean that we can't imagine it and thus have a traumatic reaction to that for sure. And, and this actually pertains to childhood memories as well, because sometimes childhood memories are fuzzy or, um, you know, distorted or something. And it's important to recognize that you know, our brains are, are never, uh, uh, you know, perfect recording machines and that we can both be traumatized by memories that are altered in the brain and we can also be untraumatized or protected from trauma by having memories be altered in a way that moves away from trauma. And, and so uh, it's a very tricky thing because our, you know, if, if you've ever seen a brain outside of its skull, whether it's human or otherwise, it's just this gray mass of goo. Um, if, and you can stick your finger right through it. Like it's just, it's like gelatin. And so uh, the fact that that's the thing that we depend on to remember things uh, it, well, it, I think it should be apparent that we can't really depend on that glob of goo to be a perfect representation of reality. But yeah, um, f you know, if your girlfriend is having traumatic uh, reactivity and needs a lot of healing around something that she doesn't remember, then that would be totally normal. I, I can't think of anyone who would go through that event not having uh, some trauma reactivity, if not extreme long lasting. Because the other aspect of this uh, that seems obvious, but I should mention is that uh, she wakes up and she's like, in all likelihood, someone targeted me at a bar, drugged me, uh, sexually abused me, and then dumped me on a lawn. 
just that knowledge alone is like, wait, I'm at danger at any time, at any time someone could just swoop in and uh, use me in that way, maybe even kill me. That is a traumatic realization to have that my body was just, you know, tossed around at will by because someone had malevolent ideas about me. That notion alone is traumatic. It's similar to if your house is broken into or you read about a lot of news stories about victimization. It's it's scary and it creates a tremendous amount of terror. I mean, my hands are just sweating just visualizing that in my head. It's it's just an awful thing to think about. So the answer is yes, you can absolutely have a trauma reactivity, um, even if you quote unquote don't remember it. All right, another email. All right, this next email is from an anonymous patron. She writes, I was curious about whether you could discuss any distinctions in the kind of externalized blaming that you see in borderline personality disorder patients versus narcissistic personality disorder patients. Are there any meaningful differences? You've described personality disorders in previous podcasts as two different strategies for managing the same problem. In borderline, you assume your caregivers are all good and you must be all bad. In narcissistic personality, you assume your caregivers are all bad and you must be all good. But if you have borderline personality disorder that is presenting with strong tendency towards externalizing coping styles, it can look very similar to narcissistic personality disorder. So I'm struggling to understand the the distinctions between this abusive presentation of borderline and and the more covert subtype of narcissism. Given your expertise in this area, how exactly do you conceptualize how a personality disorder is manifesting in a particular patient? You often get on a soapbox about how the DSM categories don't reflect the clinical reality, but what's the real structure behind how you conceptualize this, completely independent of the DSM categories? End of email. Yeah, great question. Love questions like this. Uh, right up my alley. Uh, one, two, it means you're paying attention, which as a professor, I always look for evidence of that. People paying attention. <laughs> you you aren't my students out there, but um, I don't know. I just get a little jolly out of that. So yeah, the more I study people, clients, people in my personal life, um, and the literature on all these topics, The more I see narcissistic personality and borderline personality is almost the same thing. Simplistically, yeah, they they have opposite working models, as you said. With narcissism, the self is all good and others are all bad. And with borderline, the self is all bad and others are all good. But those are just defenses, defenses that cover up a deeper trauma and a deeper reality that both believe they are utterly, utterly worthless. Now, we're also talking about a spectrum here. So um, some people have severe borderline, some people have minor uh, case of borderline tendencies, and same with narcissism. But if we're talking about people above a certain threshold, people with narcissism, people with borderline, underneath uh, it all, they believe they are utterly worthless, worthless based on the traumas that they experience, the abandonment, the... Um, the trials and tribulations of, of their childhood, which can be quite obvious in the case of sexual abuse and can be not so obvious in the case of emotional abandonment, even though physically the parents were there. So the borderline person copes with that by saying, I'm going to depend on others to uh, m- sort of fulfill my self-esteem and I'm going to be pretty much on a constant uh, vigilance to Uh, seek that uh, validation from others. And when there's any hint of that, of that validation not being there or any kind of hint of of rejection, I'm going to react very strongly because I want people to know how I feel so that they um, can meet my needs with a narcissistic person. They have a strategy of dealing with that utter, utter worthlessness by uh, saying, you know what? I give up on people. Other people are stupid. I am superior and I have it all going on. I, I can depend on myself. I don't need anybody else. Um, I'm perfect. I'm better than others. Um, why would I depend on others when they're not very dependable and they're also kind of like stupid and, and inferior to me? I, I, I've got everything um, going on here. But underneath that is 
utter worthlessness. So even though the narcissistic person has a working model of self that is very uh, distorted as superior, underneath that defense is a working model of self that is just as utterly worthless as the borderline person. So they can operate in a very similar manner and they can both externalize and they can both be terribly abusive. Having said that, many are not abusive. You know, people equate narcissistic and borderline on the internet with, especially narcissism um, with, well, they, you know, they obviously are abusive. That's not true. Uh, many people with narcissistic personality disorder are not abusive. Now, if you're uh, uh, above a certain threshold in all likelihood, your uh, spouses or partners can speak to some level of mistreatment. But really, you know, most people mistreat their partners at some point. Um, so does it rise to the level of what we might call abuse? Um, you know, it's hard to know. And there's really no data on this because uh, to measure someone's narcissism requires a lot of assessment, meaning, you know, several hours of interviews and treatment. Plus, um, there's not everyone considers narcissistic personality disorder to be the same thing. Um, but the definition I'm using is the, you know, the standard within personality disorder literature and, and expertise. Uh, now, you're you're struggling, anonymous patron. You're just like I don't understand. Like, I'm I'm looking at other people around me, and I and I see that they're being abusive. You know, is it borderline? Is it narcissism? I can't really figure it out. Is it you know? Is it a, a abusive borderline or is it a covert narcissistic? You know, the thing is, is people get hung up on the labels. You know, we we rarely, as as you said that I said, we rarely fit neatly into those labels. We like labels. You know, it's daytime, it's nighttime. I'm a vegan, I'm not a vegan. This person's a liberal, that person's a conservative, and so on. But humans are much more messy than that. And it's much more sound to conceptualize people from a trauma and attachment reactivity perspective. Essentially, and as you were pointing out, we uh, all have attachment injury and trauma to some extent. It's just a matter of degree. And it also, uh, how we coped with it, how we've healed with it, and what are our defenses, what are our reactivity to cope. We all have to cope with the fact that we routinely have our feelings hurt. We all have to cope with the fact that we routinely feel as though we aren't good enough for love or attention. We all have to have a way of coping with that. And there are various different ways of coping on, a, shall we say, a spectrum from healthy to unhealthy. Um, and usually it's related to how much one has been uh, mistreated growing up. The more mistreatment you have, the more your defenses tend to be dysfunctional. Now, they were functional when you were a kid because you needed that particular odd presentation. You know, for the narcissistic person, that's not a functional way to live, right? To believe you're superior to others and that you can live life without um, anyone helping you because that's not functional, right? But that was helpful to that person when they were growing up because they needed to do that because that's the way their life was presenting it to them. But later on in life, when they actually interface with people who might actually meet their needs, they're still pushing people away and they're still considering themselves superior. So, um, for those people, you know, it was more severe in terms of the mistreatment they went through. For another person, because uh, we all go through disappointment, we all go through rejection, we all go through worthlessness, we all have low self-esteem uh, to some extent. And for, say, someone who went through a, uh, a more optimal childhood where the disappointments were uh, relatively few and far between, they still have a, they still have a way of coping. And maybe their way of coping is distancing uh, for a little bit of time or a little bit of superiority or a little bit of dependence on other people or a little bit of lashing out. But then they recover and they, they find their way to being more direct and more functional with their bids for um, correcting for the rejection. Like, for example, uh, your spouse is working a lot and uh, you're, you miss your spouse and you sort of feel like your spouse comes home stressed out and isn't really paying attention to you. So at first you kind of distance and you say like, fuck him. I don't like him anymore. 
and then you say, oh, no, I, I, I need to reach out to him and um, I trust him. He's a good person. You go to him and, you, and you're like, hey, you know, I miss you. Um, can we spend some time this weekend? You know, uh, that's a functional way. But you have to have a, a trust in other people and a trust that you're lovable. And if you're not given that message in, uh, sufficiently as a child, then, you know, you're not going to have that option. It's going gonna, it's gonna to feel like, well, why would I put myself in a vulnerable position to be automatically hurt by my spouse? It's, that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, so it's much more sound to conceptualize people, like I said, from a trauma and attachment perspective. Attachment injury and trauma leads to defenses and reactivity to cope. And often a style develops, right? As in, uh, now, in, in extreme cases, some people don't develop a style, and that's what we call disorganized attachment. Sometimes that can look like borderline and narcissism, by the way. But, you know, these styles that develop early in life, we, you know, sometimes we call that narcissistic personality disorder. Sometimes we call it borderline personality disorder. Sometimes we call it sadism or psychopathy or generalized anxiety or depression or PTSD or complicated grief or preoccupied attachment or um, avoidant attachment. And, you know, they're all just styles of coping. And uh, everyone is uh, now humans seem to have a limited set available to them in terms of what they can do to cope. You know, no human uh, copes with attachment difficulty by uh, becoming a a spaceman (laughs) or something, you know, uh, 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 that probably doesn't make any sense. But uh, no human can cope with attachment injury by becoming an energy being, right? Because we physically, we can't become an energy being. (laughs) So we seem to have like a, a certain set of coping styles that we categorize in the DSM and uh, well outside the DSM. And sometimes we label that borderline, sometimes we label that narcissism, sometimes we, we label that depression, that kind of thing. And uh, But no one just, it's not like people wake up and go like, okay, I'm going to read the book on borderline and become borderline. They, they just sort of naturally find their way to coping in a way that we clinicians will label as borderline. And the only reason why we have these labels is because we have to have some way of codifying the conditions so that we can apply a treatment to it and we can also apply research to it. Otherwise, if, if we just did away with all the labels and said, well, you know, everyone's different, which is actually what I believe, but if we followed that philosophy, it would be imp- almost impossible to research anything in terms of psychotherapy treatment, and it would be hard to communicate between different uh, clinicians. Um, in some ways, I wish we would kind of at least go in that more in that direction, because even among clinicians, we'll, we'll tend to say, oh, this person has generalized anxiety, and other clinicians tend to over-assume that they know what the other clinician means by that, and, and often they don't actually mean know what they mean by that. And everyone's different and they have different presentations. Anyway, so with my clients, I don't really see narcissistic and borderline as really different things. They they have the same traumas often, the same abuse, the same abandonment, the same emotional neglect, and they tend to have the same reactivity to life and to therapy. They might have different progressions in their transference. For example, with borderline, uh, a very typical transference progression is idealization of the therapist early. And then there's some um, landmine that the therapist steps on. And then the therapist is all bad in the client's eyes. But deep down, the client is still uh, desperate and hopeful that um, the therapist will, you know, pass the test and become that all, you know, return to that all good status. You know, the client will kind of bounce back and forth between all bad and all good. And then eventually, you know, you're headed towards balance. With narcissistic personality, it, it can start with idealization. But often it starts with distance and superiority on behalf of the client. But they have a... With narcissistic personality, um, they also have a desperation that feels very similar to people with borderline. Again, because the underlying condition is the same, the worthlessness and the lack of attunement and the lack of, of attachment security has been the same for the borderline and the narcissistic person. So they both have that 
desperation and that hope and and that uh, amount of neediness that is um, you know in there somewhere. The borderline person just tends to show it more readily, and the narcissistic person tends to not show it and deny it. But I can detect it as a as a therapist, in the same way that when a borderline person puts me into the all bad cat camp and I and I am now, you know the the reasons for all their troubles. I will, uh, you know, I can see past that and see like, well, what's ha- really happening here is I'm triggering a trauma for them that, uh, you know, was very true for them growing up repeatedly where they were disappointed and they were abandoned and they were rejected unfairly and they were traumatized by their caregivers and um, they're transferring that onto me. I can see past that. So I can see past the distancing and the superiority and the narcissistic person and pretty easily see the neediness and the the grasping desperation that that person has. Um, the narcissistic person can also be triggered to, to believe that I'm all bad. Um, then again, we're, we're trying to head towards balance uh, with everyone. So to go on with your email here, let's go on here. I'm currently recovering from an abusive relationship with somebody who was somewhere between borderline personality disorder and covert narcissistic personality disorder. And almost all of our arguments were characterized by constant projective identification that I was evil and untrustworthy, which provided the justification for the violence upon me. Reflecting back on it, I'm really struck by how every attempt I made to argue with his projections resulted directly in his feeling even more unable to trust me. It's like the only thing he could he could believe was true was his projection about me, and anything I did to prove otherwise was evidence that I was untrustworthy, specifically because it didn't match with his projection. He would only believe what I said if it fit the projection. The projection. Everything else was dismissed as a lie. What the hell is going on here? Is there any way to assert oneself as existing independent of the projection in a healthy way that won't backfire? Or are you just doomed to make to or are you just doomed to need to leave if someone has decided you're a great projection screen in the relationship? End of email. Yeah, this is a very complicated thing. And uh, how do I do, you know describe it in brief? Yeah, you're describing it well. You're very self-aware and you're a pretty good analyzer of your past relationship. Uh, it, it's, it's quite convincing the way you describe it. And it's, it is something that happens a lot. Um, now, I will say that in all likelihood, you were projecting as well. Uh, I'm not going to say that you were distorted, but we all project. We all use projective identification in all of our relationships. We are, we're all recreating. We're all seeing our relationships through past lenses developed. Um, so, you know, I'll say that, but you're, you're identifying, look, you know, he was projecting onto me that I was a bad person. I was untrustworthy. And when I tried to prove him otherwise, he would say, you're lying to me, you know, that's unacceptable. And until you kind of agreed with his projection, uh, things were going bad for you. There's a number of different ways of conceptualizing this. One is, is that we all recreate our past relationships with our spouses and uh, we have a need to do that for a number of reasons. One, for familiarity. Two, to, uh, we're trying to create a corrective experience. Um, and three, because we need to externalize the internalization because it's it's a lot harder for it to be internalized. It's It's much easier... I've talked about this in other episodes, but very briefly, say, you know, you're a child and you uh, experience a father who is very critical and rejecting and hurtful and maybe even abusive. You internalize that relationship. So you have that that uh, abusive, rejecting person inside of you while also having the side of you that you observed, which is the victim. So you you retain that relationship in your psyche. Now you're actually now you have in your brain this self voice of you're worthless, you're a piece of shit, you deserve to be because you internalize that that other person. You also now have the capacity to abuse other people because you've actually internalized that that personality trait um, from your father. Well, to have that ongoing self uh, flagellation in one psyche is too much to handle, and so we tend to want to externalize at least one side of it. And so what he did is he externalized the victim side. He externalized his child onto you, and he adopted 
the uh, personality of the person who was abusing him. And he proceeded to treat you the way he was treated when he, when he was a child, if that makes sense. He made you feel the feelings that he felt when he was growing up. And uh, so again, uh, we have a need for externalization because it's much more comfortable than an internal uh, battle that's going on. We also have a need for familiarity because that's what we're used to. And we're also trying to create a corrective experience unconsciously. Um, it's not always working in that way. And so, uh, uh, and the, the reason, going back to the first reason, you know, that we externalize, it's not only just because it's more comfortable, but it's also like we have a need to enact these personality traits um, and uh, for various reasons with him in all likelihood, he felt very powerless growing up. And so there's a big part of him that feels powerless. And so in order, we all have a need for power. And uh, since he has an ongoing background static of powerlessness, um, he's in a constant battle with his psyche to try to establish that he has some power. He's always looking for evidence. Like, do I have power in the world? This is very upsetting. It's very scary that I don't have any power. And so he would exert his power over you uh, as a way of proving to himself that he does at least have some power. Um, it's not a functional way because ultimately you pull away and you dump him or whatever, and then he feels powerless again. So it's, it, it, it's not ultimately helpful or healthy, obviously, or moral, but there's a lot of reasons why people do this. So, so anyway, he's, he's treating you this way. And if, if you don't fit into his projection, his projective identification process, then you're throwing everything off. You're you you're make if, if you act different or you propose a different reality, he now has to find someone else to to project onto. But he, you're the closest person, so it's much easier to kind of uh, yell at you or behaviorally kind of force you to agree with his projective identification than for him to face himself, for him to. Um, deal with the fact that he he has the inner uh, uh, abused child that he's really struggling with. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why someone would, would get really upset about it. And when the, when the defense is so needed because of the worthlessness that's so deep, the individual will have a lot of denial and a lot of distortions in terms of the way they see the world that uh, all uphold the defense. It's sort of like when you talk to someone who is um, you know, struggling with addiction and um, say they drink alcohol and they're, they drink a bottle of wine every night uh, at dinner and, and fall asleep. And you know their life is functional, but they are probably drinking every night because of some trauma they went through earlier in their life or they, they feel alone or there's some kind of emotional struggle they're going through. Well, you come up to them and let's say you say, uh, hey, you know, I think you're drinking too much. You are drinking way too much wine. That's alcoholic. You, you're drinking every day. Well, that person, by, you know, when you say that to that person, part of them is agreeing with you. Part of them is like, yeah, you know what? It is kind of bad that I drink every day. But another, another part of them is thinking, okay, if I am drinking too much, then that means I need to stop drinking. That means I might need to stop drinking altogether, which means I will have no way of coping with my feelings because that's why I started drinking in the first place it was because my feelings were overwhelming to me. And I felt, again, this background static of terribleness. That's why I started drinking in the first place. So one of these sides have to win, either the side that says, yes, I need to stop drinking, I'm drinking too much, or the other side is just like, well, how, you know, what else am I supposed to do to deal with these feelings? So it's a very quick calculus that happens for the individual. And if they land on the side of like, look, I need my alcohol to cope with my feelings, I, you know, I don't have any other way to cope, then the person is going to come back at you and say like, well, well, well first this thing can happen is the brain is going to be, is going to create all these narratives that uphold the alcohol use. Like, oh, I'm, it's just a bottle of wine. You know, people drink wine all the time. Research shows that wine even extends your life. 
And I only drink a specific kind of wine that's supposed to be really healthy for you. And, you know, I still have a job and who the fuck are you to judge me? I mean, you smoke pot, you know, there's all these things that come, that thoughts, and then, and then comes the defensiveness from the person. And if you hook up the person to a lie detector test, they believe all these things because the ego has very, you know, effective ways of, of retaining our defenses. You know, the drinking is a defense and, and so is the narcissism, so is the borderline. And so when you're interacting with this person and you're trying to oppose their projection, you're just like, um, I don't think you're seeing this right. You know, you're accusing me of doing these bad things, but I'm here to tell you, like, uh, that's not what happened. <laughs> um, that's at least that's not my intention. But, you, you know, you seem to think that I intended to hurt your feelings. But, you know, I, I'm telling you, I did not intend on hurt, hurting your feelings. I love you. I, I'm involved with you. Why would I want to do that? Well, by telling them that you are fucking with their defenses, which means that they have to uh, forego their defense and now face the fact that they have a problem on the inside. And, and there's, they feel, and so that's the paradox is the reason why they created the defense is because they believe they're utterly worthless, just worthless. I mean, if you don't have one of these personality disorders, you, you've probably suffered from like mild self, self-esteem issues where you just, oh boy, that was, you know, that was cringeworthy where, you know, you're lying awake at night, like regretting something you said at a party last week or something, you know, that's normal, that low self-esteem. People with personality disorders like narcissism and borderline histrionic are, have such a deep, deep sense of worthlessness where they're not only worthless, but they're nothing. You know, underneath that veil of defense, whether it's borderline or narcissism or histrionic, is this vast sea of an abyss of just like, not only am I worthless, but I'm nothing. I'm, I'm nothing. I don't even exist in this world. And that is a terrifying reality for people. And now, I will always say, because I always say this, is that uh, these people are not worthless. They are, they, there isn't a dark abyss. There actually is a self down there. There is worth. They just can't see it and they don't have access to it. Uh, and, I, you know, the metaphor of, of the bedroom where you're staring into your bedroom and the lights are off and you don't see anything and you think it's an empty room. But in fact, you just have to turn up the lights. And the way you do that is through a lot of secure relationships, a lot of reflection, a lot of uh, sacred space and therapy where a, cl- where a therapist really listens and kind of draws that out, unconditional positive regard, attunement, all that kind of stuff is what we want to give kids when they're two, three, four years old, when they do turn up the lights on their bedroom. And if they're not given that, then in therapy, we have to give them that. Anyway, so you're asking like, you know, what the hell is going on there? Is there any way to assert yourself as existing independent of the projection in a healthy way that won't backfire. Um, Now, I have a lot of experience with this, not only personally, because I've experienced a lot of people with personality disorders in my personal life, but also professionally, obviously, because I specialize in this uh, condition, these conditions. And you're asking the same question that, that therapists will ask themselves. How do I prove myself to this person with borderline, with histrionic, with uh, narcissism, that their idea of me is actually false, that I actually do care, that I actually didn't mean to hurt their feelings, that I actually, um, you know, don't have thoughts of abandoning them. How do I assert myself? How do I convince them? Well, to a therapist, it's much easier to kind of navigate that because, you know, they come to therapy every week and the, the therapist is trained to do this. The therapist isn't really personally involved in the back and forth of the relationship. And so, um, although it's very hard for a therapist to do, to do this, and a lot of therapists um, have a really hard time with this, um, and no therapist is perfect, me included, um, but uh, if you're a specialist in this, it's actually pretty easy to do once you know and have some experience and have good supervision and blah, blah, blah. If you're in a relationship with someone, though, it's very hard to uh, to navigate this. Although you do have something that therapists don't have, which is the ability to hug and kiss and maybe even have sex as a way of, of showing behaviorally that you are on their side. Um, now, the other thing I'll say is that if you're in an abusive relationship, uh, regardless of the conceptualization of the abuser, you deserve to not be abused. So, um, you know, the implication that, you know, sort of the question you're asking is like, you know, how do I, 
deal with this abusive behavior in a way that is clinically sound? You know, it's a fine question, but another question I would pose to you is, you know, at what point is it um, uh, sort of in your best interest to leave this person? Uh, yes, it's possible that there's, you know, some plan that you could go on as a spouse to be the best spouse for that person so that they would recover from their traumas. Uh, and, you know, certainly all spouses have to ask themselves that question on some level. Um, but there's also a question of just like, you know, when do you throw in the towel uh, for your own benefit? Are you just martyring yourself unnecessarily? Um, going on with your email here. He completely idealized and adored one of my cats and had persistent tension with my other cat. He was projecting weird intentions into that cat like telling me the cat had peed on the floor in front of him while giving him a defiant look. And that cat had attacked him when he tried to clean him. Three days after that incident, my cat had been acting so strangely that I took him to the ER and discovered he had sustained five fractured ribs consistent with a kick. The vet basically told me privately, someone kicked your cat. I remember my ex even... I remember my ex even thought to suggest that the landlord was responsible since he had a set of keys. Can you speak about how sadism develops and how it interacts with severe personality disorders? It's profoundly upsetting. This is a step beyond narcissistic personality disorder, right? This kind of violence. I'm finding it very difficult to wrap my head around how to have compassion for sadists. I want to, but I just cannot fathom how someone could be hurting an animal for months and just completely lying about it and feel no remorse. That cat is basically my child and he was hurting him and lying about it. How can a person do this? What makes them become this way? How do you even begin to treat someone like that? What kind of transference do therapists experience when working with sadists? Great questions, but first let's take a break. And if you're a patron, you will not hear the commercials. And if you are, Wait, if you're a patron, you won't hear the commercials. And if you are not a patron, you will hear the commercials. All right, let's go to break. All right, we're back from the break. If you're not a patron of the podcast, please do so. Go to patreon.com. That's really the main way I get to know, we get to know that you actually appreciate what we're doing on this podcast. Um, I get an email whenever someone signs up and I'm like, oh, that warms my heart. That means we're on the right track. So if you're not a patron, please do so. Okay. So uh, again, now you're switching to sadism, which in back in the day, we would call that sadistic personality disorder. I'm not really quite sure they exclude that because it really is a helpful construct. But that's a construct, even though that's not in the DSM, I still use it because it's useful. Same with psychopathy, that's not in the DSM. Um, so sadistic personality disorder is something you're now sort of uh, applying to your ex-spouse. Uh, and the first thing I'll say is that's awful. And I've been there before. I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, the, th how do I say this? Um, People who are sadists, people who are struggling with personality disorders and have a, a lot of aggression, will abusive people, if you will, will sometimes target people close to you as a proxy for the aggression that they want to do to you. Also, um, you know, animals are kind of defenseless; they can't talk, and so. Abusive people will sometimes abuse animals because it's just easier. Of course, sadists will abuse animals because they, they take pleasure in abusing other people. So unless you have more to say, I, I'm not hearing any evidence of sadism. What I'm hearing is um, more, person more potential narcissism, uh, extreme borderline uh, kinds of behaviors. We could also, you know, talk about antisocial or, or psychopathy as well. But uh, it, so again, many people with narcissism and, and borderline do not abuse others. Uh, these, this is a, a lot of people uh, for me and other experts will apply the label of narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, histrionic, even antisocial to a lot of people. And many of those people do not abuse people. So I don't want to uh, associate these labels, but 
uh, when you have these kinds of personality disorders, especially at extreme levels, and you are struggling internally, then you are going to feel a lot of hurt. You're going to feel a lot of pain as the result of other people's behavior. Now, some of that pain is justified and some of that pain is a result of the person's distortions based on their personality disorder. So, you know, you, let's say, um, I don't know, you get into a fight with your spouse and your spouse, uh, your ex-spouse interprets that as some kind of massive betrayal that you uh, imposed upon him. And now he's, you know, he interprets that again because of his childhood, because it triggers this actual betrayal he went through. And he's, again, through projective identification, recreating that relationship with you. And now uh, he simultaneously feels that victim as, a, as that inner three-year-old being rejected, abused, or whatever. He's feeling all those feelings. And they're deep and they're horrible. And he, he just feels like um, it's just the worst. And it just, and when you feel very hurt, you usually feel justified in being very upset. For example, um, we all have that kind of gauge. Like, like, let's say that your spouse, let's say, you know, uh, you're in a good relationship, but, um, you know, one night, uh, five years ago, you got in this pretty bad fight and your, your spouse tells you, um, I never should have married you or, um, you know, you're, you're just like your dad or whatever it is that, you know, was a very hurtful thing to say. And in response, you were very, very hurt by that. And as a result of that hurt, you said something really nasty back. You said something like, well, you're just like your mother or, you know, or you're a piece of shit or, you know, whatever it is that you said. Well, if you just take that behavior out of context, you calling your spouse a piece of shit, we would say like, wow, that's crossing the line. There's really no situation where that's okay. But when we look at the bigger picture, we're like, well, you know, your spouse called you a name just before that. You were, you know, it was three hours of fighting. You were very hurt. Um, it's a trigger for you. It doesn't justify what you said, but it makes sense. Well, to the person with borderline or with narcissism or histrionic, uh, uh, they are very easily pushed into a place of it feeling very, very hurt and very, very angry as a result. And thus their reactivity comes from um, that uh, from that place. Again, it doesn't justify it at all, but it explains it. And to the person, um, they don't believe that they're like, ha ha ha, I'm going to be an asshole right now because I like to be an asshole. No, they're, they, they're acting in a way, in the same way when you called your spouse a piece of shit five years ago, um, looking back, or at least at the time, you'd be like, well, I mean, I called him a piece of shit because he said I was just like my father. And he said that um, he wished he never married me before. You know, there's, we're just like, hey, you know, you really hurt my feelings. So that's why I called you a piece of shit. That's what it's like for the personality disordered person is it's like, hey, you did that thing, which made me feel terrible, which, you know, it makes sense that I was so angry. Yeah, it's not okay for me to do what I did, but, you know, I only did it because of what you did first. Now, from the outside, you're often thinking, but you overreacted <laughs> and you projected a bunch of shit onto what I did. Like everything's thrown off, but to the personality disorder, it doesn't feel that way and it doesn't compute because uh, they're, they're undifferentiated in their feelings and their thoughts. And it felt hurtful, thus it must have been justifiable. Plus, the notion from you of saying your feelings are distorted is yet another rejection. And so to tell a borderline person, to tell a narcissistic person your feelings are distorted is extremely triggering to them because they're just like, okay, once again, I'm being rejected based on my feelings. My feelings aren't being heard. My feelings are worthless. Um, and so that's going to re-traumatize them and they're going to come back again because of the hurt that they're being triggered. The deep, deep, deep hurt uh, of rejection of growing up is going to get triggered again and they're, they're going to come after you. So any attempt to try to correct that in the other person is uh, not likely to go over very well. Again, I'm talking about a particular uh, threshold 
threshold of narcissism and borderline and a particular kind of version of it. And not if some of you out there diagnose yourself or have been diagnosed by clinicians with narcissism or borderline or histrionic. Um, and you're probably listening, you're like, well, I'm not really like that. And yeah, that's true. So we're, I'm talking about a specific sliver of, of the population. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, all the evidence, email or anonymous patron is that your ex uh, boyfriend was was a was physically abusing your cat and had broken five fractured ribs on your cat. I mean, I get chills just thinking about like what that must have meant. I mean, what was he doing to your cats while you weren't around? And like I said, I can relate to this. I I've been there before. This is awful. Um, so then you ask, you know, can you speak to how sadism develops? Well. Like I said, I can't really say that this is sadistic. Sadism is when someone takes pleasure in hurting other people, unprovoked. Uh, Now, if they're provoked, then they still will take pleasure in it. But they will just, uh, you know, in the way that you watch Netflix for fun or you go on a hike for fun, sadists hurt other people for fun. So it's unclear. Now, it's possible he was a sadist, but I'm not really hearing that in the data you're presenting. Obviously, I can't diagnose. I'm just um, reading an email. But the it it it's it's probably more consistent with your previous conceptualization of narcissism or borderline in that he was projecting onto a cat, which we we all do, um, uh, to functionally or dysfunctionally. And so this cat, you know, so cats can be a little off putting sometimes. I mean, my cats can be, you know, real jerk faces sometimes. Um, uh, dogs can be too, for that matter. Uh, they're less likely to have that kind of turn, but you know, so it's not unusual for uh, someone to feel like, you know, what I feel like that cat doesn't really like me that much. And if you have a sensitivity to rejection, just because it's a cat doesn't mean that you aren't deeply hurt by that. So he was probably deeply hurt by the fact that this cat was having evidence of of rejection of him. And then, of course, he treats the cat badly, and of course, the cat hates him. And it you know it's a feedback loop, which eventually leads to. The, um, him kicking the the cat while you weren't around, which is just, I mean, if there is a hell, there is a hot, lonely, terrible place of, of hell that are dedicated to people who kick cats um, or any animal, any defenseless creature of any kind. Anyway, um, so it it that you don't necessarily have to invoke the idea of sadism to conceptualize that behavior. Um, again, he might have felt like one, he was justified in kicking the cat because of how hurt it the cat made him feel. And I know that sounds silly, but uh, when you have a, a personality disorder that developed, be, you know, it's in all likelihood, he grew up uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five years old, uh, being rejected, being kicked maybe for things that were completely unjustified. And so for him, not only is kicking someone modeled as something that's possible, but also he believes, the, you know, he's been treated in a way where he was just like completely worthless. And when a cat looks at him a little funny, it triggers that worthlessness in him and he just feels terrible about himself. And then he feels angry about feeling terrible to the, you know, vector of, you know, to the creature that made him feel that way. And then he feels justified in lashing out. Um, unknown, of course, but, you know, so then you say, you know, I'm having a very difficult time wrapping my, uh, head around how to have compassion for him. You know, you don't have to have compassion for him. One, you're not a therapist. Therapists need to access that compassion if they're treating people like him, but you're not treating him. So you don't have to have any compassion for him if you don't want to. Um, if you want to have compassion, uh, that's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you don't have to. The other thing is, is, uh, compassion doesn't mean that you feel great about their behavior, you know, for the people that I've had clients before, like him, actually, uh, domestic violence, you know, intimate partner violence, uh, perpetrators, I had tremendous compassion for them, but I had absolutely no fucking sympathy for the way they treated other people. (laughs) The things they told me that they did, I was in my, at least in my head, I'm like, my God, dude, what the fuck? You know, like, stop that shit. Like you are, you are doing terrible things to people. 
I, ugh, ish, ish, gross. Ugh. And I have compassion for you because I know how much trouble you've been through in your life and I know your reactivity, but man, that is an awful behavior that you just did. And, and the fact that you are justifying it is just so gross to me. You know, you can have all those mixture of feelings. That it doesn't, you know, having compassion doesn't mean you just erase everything someone's done uh, in reality. It doesn't erase like morality and like the ability to see behavior for what it is. I suspect you might have a sort of on the other side of the coin uh, traumas that lead you to strive to accommodate people like this. Uh, I don't know that, but your question kind of leads in that direction. And so uh, you certainly don't have to do that. Um, so you say here, uh, how can a person do this? What makes them become that way? How do you even begin to treat someone like that? So how do you treat someone like that? Well, uh, and I've treated many people like this, many uh, perpetrators of, of abuse, many people with severe personality disorders. Uh, there are, it's complicated and listen to all my other deep dives on it, but in a nutshell, uh, the overarching goal is to have them internalize a secure uh, attachment with you, the therapist. And uh, to do that, I have to create a relationship with the client that is at least somewhat deep. It, I can't be standoffish. I'm really not standoffish to any of my clients, hopefully. Um, but I, I have to create a relationship in which we're we're interfacing. There's there's some fluidity of back and forth between us that uh, I'm not just a standoff clinician. And so, you know, we're we're, we're talking about our relationship. Um, there's there's an exchange of of uh, of dependency slash me parenting, so to speak. It's complicated, but anyway. So I have to facilitate that, and, and I have to help the client kind of uh, move in that direction. Often the client is seeking that anyway, so I don't really have to do much, but, but I have to head in that direction. Once that um, intensity is there, then I have to uh, pass tests, and I have to uh, be secure over time. So there's this overarching security that I'm trying to provide, meaning that I'm attuned to their feelings. Um, I like them for who they are. There's unconditional positive regard. I believe in them. Um, I, I'm stable. I, I show up to sessions on time. I um, communicate in very consistent ways. Um, you know, I'm, I, there's a very there's a consistency to it that they can depend on for years. Um, and by the way, if you're one of those therapists that shows up late to your clients, shame on you. Um, you are hurting your clients often. Um, so. Because I hear about these cases, people email me. My client is all, or my therapist is always five or ten minutes late for my sessions, and I just like head slap. I'm like, what is wrong with that therapist? I mean, come on, it's not that fucking hard, people, to follow a goddamn schedule. You know, uh, you're a grown adult. Like, <laughs> come on. Anyway, so. Uh, and plus, like, don't you understand like the damage you're doing? It's like, why did you become a therapist anyway? So. I'm providing that secure. I'm, I'm very dedicated to them. I'm, you know, I'm very. I try to be as attuned as possible. And then, as time goes on, they will test me. Not consciously. They're not. You know, usually, sometimes they are consciously testing me, but usually it's not conscious. And you know, um, they will come to me, for example. And this is always a glorious moment that I'm looking forward to. Is they'll say, you know, you said something last session that was really terrible. Um, I can't believe you said what you said to me last session. And this is a wonderful moment. One, it means that our relationship is deep enough for them to be affected by me. Two, it means our the relationship has progressed where they're starting to transfer onto me their past relationships. Um, now, I might have I might have done something. You know, I might have done something terrible. I mean, it's not like I'm immune to doing stupid things because I can and will. But their reactivity is a wonderful opportunity. So it's a test, right? So. Um, what am I going to do? That's what, that they're curious. Like I'm, you know, they've been thinking about it all week in unlikelihood, and they're like, I'm going to lay this out for my therapist. Now, what I do is I thank them and I contain that, and I sincerely apologize. I don't just clinically apologize. I, since you know, whatever they're saying, I react to in a very human way that's from my heart, that isn't from my head, and I don't make any excuses and. Um, I might provide an explanation, but I don't 
you know, excuse. I don't, I don't get defensive that there's no point in that. And I congratulate them on their courage. And I thank them for trusting me with one of the most vulnerable things one can ever communicate, which is you hurt my feelings last week. And, um, and I'm now giving you an opportunity to correct for that. And what a wonderful opportunity. I, I am so honored, not only when clients do that, but when anyone does that, you know, when my wife tells me something that I did that was wrong, I'm like, thank you so much. I, I know it's not easy to, to say stuff like that. You know, uh, I, I think you're terribly wrong wife because ABC, no, just joking. Um, so that's, that takes a long time. You know, you got to do that in, in my, uh, you know, clients that I've treated, it is years and years uh, before uh, there is recovery um, truly from the personality disorder, from the traumas that lead to what we call a personality disorder. Um, but I've been there, you know, I, I, I've had clients where I've treated them for 10 years. And uh, after that time, uh, they were totally unsymptomatic with their personality disorder. But it takes a long time, and there's a lot of passing of tests, and there's a lot of difficulty, and there's a lot of um, ups and downs in therapy. It's it's not easy for the therapist, but that's why I got into this gig, and that's why most therapists got into it. So there is that. Your last question is, what kind of transference do therapists experience when working with sadists? Well, like I said, I, I don't know if your ex was a sadist. I'm not hearing any evidence of that. But... Uh, sadists don't usually go to therapy one. So it's, it's kind of a rare counter transference that or therapy or transference kind of scenario, but sadists do occasionally, um, in therapy, sometimes they're forced to be in therapy. And so that for the sadist, um, it depends because there's a lot of, there's a, there's a spectrum of sadism. Um, but usually if it is true sadism, the, and the therapist detects it, there's a, there's a terrible amount of fear that the therapist will feel. I mean, when when you have a, you know, let's say it's a 17-year-old boy who has been reported to set fires and has poked out the eyes of neighborhood cats and dogs and um, maybe put a cat in a microwave and killed it, um, as a therapist, you're just like, my God, is this like Hannibal Lecter? Is he going to like kill me? There's there's a tremendous amount of fear, mostly because of movies, honestly. And I've, I've had a lot of supervisees that I have to sort of calm down. I'm like, uh, you've seen too many movies. This, this client is, is extremely unlikely to stalk you and kill you. <laughs> um, now, they're likely to enact their sadism with people around them, but they're probably not going to target you because you have a lot of power and you can see through them on some level. So they, they know better than to, you know, sadists like to attack defenseless people. They don't usually like to attack people who have power. You know, they don't go up to a police officer and try to fuck with them. What they do is they find young people or animals um, or people close to them whom they can manipulate. Um, those are the people they target. They don't usually target therapists. Um, having said that, there's uh, some sadism that can come out in the therapeutic relationship. The, the, the client might like to lie or you know, like to kind of fuck with the the therapist that the client, the sadistic client might like to see the therapist squirm. So maybe the clients, you know, talks about, yeah, there was this one cat and I cut it up into pieces as a way of trying to get the therapist to squirm in their seat a little bit. And as a therapist, you have to be ready for that and uh, contain it and not fall into that projective identification. So a lot of supervision and consultation you have to go through when you're treating a sadist. Um, and, you know, people say, well, you can't get rid of sadism. Um, yeah, maybe. But I, I've treated people with all personality disorders. And I'm here to tell you that um, I, I've never found a case that I was like, yeah, there's nothing I can do for this person. Now, there's plenty of people that I only met briefly and wasn't able to go on the long journey with. And so maybe those people were untreatable. But everyone that I've come into, including sadists, you know, there was there there have been... Uh, people who I don't think I framed them as sadistic, but looking back, uh, they definitely had sadistic qualities. And again, it's usually a reaction. This is just me. Okay. Other people have different conceptualizations. There's a, there's a lot of people that believe sadists are born that way. Um, certainly we have dispositions and no one can refute that. But in my experience, people who exhibit sadistic behavior and uh, report sadistic feelings on the inside, 
uh, went through difficulty growing up. And the, uh, the coping style that they developed was uh, one of power and of manipulation. And so, uh, you know, they're two years old and they feel pa- utterly powerless. And uh, one of the ways that you can adopt power, there's many different roads to power. You can get power through sexuality. You can get power through distance. You can get power through emotional demands. You can get power through physical abuse. And another way you can get power is through sadism. You can just be like, you know, I am going to be a monster and monsters have power. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get people before they get me, God damn it. And um, and when I have, when I need that power, I'm going to take it. And, you know, it's, it's not a pleasant <laughs> defense, but, but it's one apparently available in my book, uh, to humans. And so, you know, uh, so what do you do? Well, you help these people have power in a way that is more functional. And often that is power within the therapeutic relationship, within a secure relationship. Can they feel power to uh, get their needs met, to, to talk, to communicate? Are they respected? Are their boundaries respected? And through that corrective experience with a therapist, um, they, their need for power and their need for security is fulfilled, and they don't need to be a sadist anymore to enact that power. Again, lots of other clinicians, including experts, will disagree with what I just said. Um, I have found that to be true. Um, And I have seen it happen. I have worked with people with sadistic qualities who, through a secure relationship, exhibit less sadistic behaviors. There's various different ways of conceptualizing that, but um, that's what I've seen. And the internet certainly doesn't talk about it like that, right? The internet certainly says these people are worthless, and um, what are you going to do? And and you just have to throw them into a you know burning volcano because that's just, that's just all they're worth. Anyway, I'm rambling. Well, an honest patron, your email took up a lot of time, so uh, that was interesting. Thanks for emailing in, and I really hope you have recovered from the traumas that you went through in that relationship, and possibly the traumas you went through growing up that sort of led to you, um, I don't know, being in that relationship in the first place. I don't know that, obviously, but um, you know, I hope you're doing okay, and from afar, I hope he's doing okay. I hope he is recovering uh, primarily so he stops abusing other people and cats in general, but also, you know, just for himself. You know, I, I hope that his his suffering is put to an end so that he doesn't make other people suffer. Okay, well, that was a pretty heavy conversation. Let's take a deep breath. I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to relax my shoulders. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to relax my neck, my back, my arms. Everything is okay. I'm safe. All y'all are hopefully safe out there. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you're on YouTube or if you're not, you can go to psychologyseattle.com, fill out the Contact Us page. That's what Anonymous Patron did, and that's what I'd like you to do if you want to contact me. It's really the only way that I'll, that I'll see it. Sometimes uh, my wife will uh, look at the YouTube comments and she'll forward me those. And so, um, you know, feel free to do that as well. And, you know, two points to people who say, uh, hey, Stacy, uh, make sure Kirk sees this um, comment if you're on YouTube. <laughs> All right. And please take care of yourself out there, really, um, because you really do deserve it. Mm-hmm.